So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the new seminar of uh, Metamat. Today, it's my pleasure to have uh, Professor Amy Carminati from uh, Institut, Institut Langevin in Paris. So uh, Amy, he's, uh, he's a full professor and he is the head of the, of the group of mesoscopic and theoretical optics in Langevin. He has uh, received uh, various uh, prize of, uh, for his work, for, like the Fabry, the Gramont Prize of the French Optical Society and many other awards. And he's uh, also elected as a fellow of the Optical Society of America in 2015. Today, the title is Optical Order Can Make Photonic Nanomaterial uh, Different. So Remy, it's my pleasure to give you the hand. All right, thank you for the nice introduction and uh, for this nice invitation. I'm very happy to contribute to this, uh, to this webinar series. So um, before I start the, the, the real topic, I have uh, the, my advertising slide just to let you know what, what, what we do uh, roughly uh, here on, on, on this topic of, uh, of light in complex media. By complex, we mean most of the time disordered and uh, sometimes at the same time disordered and nanostructured. And uh, so we, we work on different aspects from very fundamental studies to, to more applied topics um, in imaging, sensing, or in the, this idea of, of designing new kind of, of materials. And that's the, the topic I'm going to focus on today. So uh, as you notice from the title, I, I will be talking about partial order that I will be uh, defining in a few minutes. Uh, it's not something new, this idea of, uh, of using uh, partially ordered materials to, to control light propagation, more generally to control wave propagation in, in complex systems. And then I, I, will, um, I will show, uh, let's say, two examples. One has to do with this concept of hyper-uniformity. So the second part will be uh, mostly conceptual and, and trying to show what are the, the degrees of freedom that we can use to change light matter interaction by only playing with the degree of partial order in a material and to try to convince you that you have, um, you have a lot of room to do, uh, to do amazing things and to not only change uh, quantitatively the numbers, but to change qualitatively even the picture of, of uh, light scattering and transport. And uh, the third part will be much more applied. So I will show you one example of something that we did in, uh, in collaboration with a group uh, of material chemists by using um, a self-assembly process to produce materials that are scattering and that under some specific conditions become transparent. So uh, it's important for me to, to, to acknowledge the, the co-workers because uh, I'm the one telling the story, but you have people that actually did the work. Uh, so this been a work uh, performed in the last, let's say, five years, uh, mostly uh, with Romain Pierra, my colleague, uh, and, and uh, a bunch of, uh, of postdocs and, uh, and, and, uh, and one PhD student that now live their own life elsewhere. And I also want to acknowledge this collaboration with Nadine Nassif and her team. So these are the material chemists uh, that help us to, to do something, uh, something real in terms of producing uh, real material. So let me start. Since I don't know uh, who in the audience is very familiar uh, or not with basic concepts in scattering, I, I have a few slides just to introduce the parameters. So the first thing you, you have to keep in mind is that uh, uh, we are dealing all over the talk with disordered material that are thick enough to multiply scatter light, which in terms of an important parameter that is the scattering mean three pass. So this scattering mean three pass, you can think of it as being the average distance between scattering events that the wave undergo inside the medium. So uh, of course, if this scattering mean three pass is much larger than the size of the sample, then you just don't have scattering. And when you increase the optical thickness, then you start in this uh, so-called single scattering regime where on average, you just scatter once 
before you exit the medium and you clearly see here the laser beam that is attenuated by scattering producing scattered light around and when you increase the degree of scattering then when the medium becomes much larger than the scattering mean free path then you end up with only diffuse light the ballistic or coherent beam is completely attenuated and that's the the regime uh, of, of interest to us so this um, attenuation is actually something that you can measure because you can you can measure the the transmitted intensity versus the incident intensity here and what you end up is the an extension let's say of the so-called bare lambert law that people know uh, usually you learn that in chemistry for purely absorbing samples but it can be generalized to a material that is at the same time scattering and absorbing and this exponential attenuation that you can measure gives access to this parameter, which is the extinction mean three pass that actually sums the effect of scattering. So this is again the scattering mean three pass I was describing on the other slide and the absorption mean three pass in case your material is also absorbing, then you mix both to build this extinction mean three pass that is, I insist on that, is a measurable quantity. So this talk is mainly about changing or even let's say controlling the scattering and the absorption means we pass by playing with partial order. So what I mean by partial order is something that is uh, of course qualitatively very simple. Okay? These are two dimensional distribution of points. And from left to right, what you do is that you increase the level of ordering in the medium. Also none of those medium is a crystal. Okay, I'm going to talk only about materials that at a large scale remain disordered. Okay, they are not uh, crystalline. They are not uh, periodic. Okay, but when you increase this level of order, then you see that the positions of the scatterers becomes more and more dependent on one, other, one another. And that changes drastically the scattering and I will show you also the absorption properties. So now if you think of those points as being, let's say, small scatterers, okay, in a transparent matrix, then you have a material. So this is what I call a nano material in the title. Okay, so you can imagine that now these are small particles in a transparent matrix, and if a wave, if light goes through, then it can be multiply scattered. And when the medium is completely disordered, like the the molecule in the gas, okay, all position between particles independent. Then the scattering mean three pass or the inverse of the scattering mean three pass scales like the density. So rho here is the number of scatterers per unit volume and sigma s is the scattering procession of an isolated scatterer. Okay, so it's what we call the independent scattering regime. This very simple law is valid provided that all positions are independent, a completely disordered material. I will call LB, B stands for Boltzmann, okay? This mean three pass, that is the reference mean three pass in the medium, provided it's completely disordered. And now, if you increase the level of order, so all those materials, okay, these are just fictitious materials here so far, but have the same number of particles, all particles remain the same, but you change the degree of order. And by doing that, you can change by orders of magnitude the scattering mean three pass. So that's this regime of coated scattering. Uh, uh, I'm going to focus on. So just to give you a flavor of, uh, of the origin of that, it's a very simple uh, mechanism that you, you send a wave on this, this random distribution of scatterers. Each of those scatterers scatter light. And then on average, you compute the intensity, which results from the interferences between all those scattered waves. Now, given some correlations between the position of the scatterers here, then when you perform this averaging, then you will keep more or less of those interferences between the different partial waves. And those interferences will completely control the level of scattering or absorption. So that's where the structure of the medium comes into play. The degree of correlation between the position of the scatterers come into play. And you can <clears throat> show that you can control the scattered intensity given this structure factor. So structure factor is a purely geometric quantity. Q here is just the difference between the observation k-vector and the incident k-vector. 
n is the number of scatterers and rj are the positions. And this bracket here means an ensemble average over all possible configurations of the disordered medium. So this quantity actually controls all interferences between all partial waves scattered by the different scatterers. And what you can show theoretically, I'm not doing any variation here. You don't have to understand in detail this formula, but what you can show is that given this shorter factor is different from one, then you change the value of the scattering means free pass by a formula like this. KR is just the wave vector in the background medium. It says two pi over lambda, lambda being the wavelength of the background in the background medium. Rho is just the density of scatterers again. F of Q just describes the scattering property of an individual scatterer. Okay, the integral of, the F of, of this F of Q would give you the scattering cross section of an individual scatterer. And this accounts for all the collective interactions between the scatterers. So that's the way you account for the change of the mean three pass due to the existence of statistical correlations between the different scatterers in the medium. Okay. So that's the only thing you need to know to, to understand uh, the, the top. So as you know, if you, if you have a crystal, a purely periodic medium, this structure factor actually gives you peaks, okay, because you have a periodic structure. It's somehow like computing <clears throat> a Fourier transform of a periodic uh, system. So you, you get delta functions, and these delta functions are responsible for Bragg peaks in the scattering by a completely crystallized structure. Now, in the case of a material of, of a distribution of points that would be completely random, then S of Q would simply be equal to one for any values of Q here. In the presence of partial order, then you get something that looks like this blue curve here. That is the signature of correlations between a particle and the neighboring particles. So that's the way you describe partial order in an otherwise disordered system. Okay, so you can compute this quantity that directly characterizes the uh, geometrical properties of your, of your scattering medium. So it's been known for a long time, okay, that if you compute the scattering property, so here you measure the scattering mean three pass, so it's a transport mean three pass, which in, in, for our purpose today, is just a detail, okay? But so wh when you compute or you measure here the, the, the mean three pass versus the volume fraction in a colloidal suspension of particles, so you have particles in a liquid, at low concentration, those particles are independent from one another, and you get this, uh, this linear relation between one over the mean three pass and the density. But when concentration increases, you start to get interaction between the particles because here you have arc sphere repulsion between the particle in a dense colloid. And then you see that the measured mean three pass deviates from the linear law. And actually this, uh, this curve is completely uh, understood by using a formula like this where S of Q now becomes the structure factor due to the interaction between the particles. So this is 1990, okay? This is all uh, physics I'm telling you about. So this, uh, this has been um, rediscussed uh, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, mostly in two groups, uh, with Frank Sheffold on one side and, and Cefe Lopez, Alvaro Blanco, Ricardo Sapienza on the other side where those people have shown that if you play now to some degree, if you control the level of interactions and the type of interaction between the particle, then you can tune, again, this is one over the mean three pass versus the volume fraction. Then you can tune the scattering properties. Here, for example, what you do is that you get something that is more scattering than what you would get for r three interactions by using charged particles with long range interactions in a liquid. So you can play with something that those authors call a photonic liquid, okay? Between, because you get a system that is in between a completely disordered solution of particles and a photonic crystal that would be purely periodic. Okay, so that's this name, photonic liquid that was given to, to this. And 
<clears throat> on the other side, um, Ricardo, who is here, and, and it's a fellow poets and co-workers, they have introduced this concept of photonic glass that has this uh, very nice feature that it's not only a highly correlated medium, okay, because you see here that particles are almost everywhere touching, so you have a lot, a lot of correlation between the particle and the neighboring particle, but the system is also strongly monodispersed. It's a highly scattering material that was produced okay, with a transport wind sweepers on the order of one micron. And what you get, for example, here is that if you measure the diffuse transmission versus the wavelength or one over the wavelengths, then you see in diffuse transmission, okay, you don't have bright peaks, but what you see here is that you have some kind of resonances that are reminiscent of the individual mi resonances of the individual particles. But the interplay between the, 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 the spectral properties of the particles and the correlations in the medium explain this unusual spectral dependence of diffuse transmission. I wanted also to show you that paper because it, it's, a, it's apparently a very, a very, very famous paper for people working in colloids, Nature 86, because this paper is the first that showed the so-called glass transition in a colloid. Okay, so it's not the topic of today to understand colloid physics, but just to make the, the story very short, you start from right to left and you get solutions of particles that are denser and denser. And what you see is that you move from a system that is disordered to a system here you can see that is polycrystalline. And the surprise was that you, you go here and you don't get a monocrystal, but you get again a disordered system that is actually a glass. And that's the first time the glass transition was evidenced in colloid. So this paper is very famous. But the nice thing is that all those colors are just structural colors. There's no pigment in none of those pictures. And it's very funny because there's not even a single word in the paper about the change in colors, which is amazing because it's, it's not only very nice, but uh, if you come from photonics, it's not something trivial that could be obviously expected, especially the change from green to blue is now something that we understand very well, but that is really um, driven by the interaction between the particle and, and the production of a structure factor that gives you a strong diffuse light scattering at a given color. Okay. But it's amazing that this paper does not mention that. Although it's to my knowledge, the first paper that really shows the appearance of structural coloration in diffuse light, which is something that nature handles very well. Okay, So it's I'm also here just in that long, uh, introduction and, and context uh, showing you that one slide on a, on a huge topic okay, that has to do with the under understanding of the appearance of color with diffuse light in nature. So you have different groups working on that. It, it, it's a, it's a, an amazing topic. But if you take, for example, the example of this bluebird, I just want to emphasize that in the phasers, what you have are structured like that. The, 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 the white bar is one micron you obviously see that it, it's a highly correlated material. It's not a crystal. So you don't have bright peak, you don't have iridescence, but you have a, a huge diffuse reflection in the blue. Okay, so nature can handle the self-assembly of structures that really show nice uh, social coloration with, again, diffuse light. Okay. So that brings me to uh, really work that, that we did recently and, and this idea of uh, using either in a rigorous way or in an approximate way that I will define uh, in a few minutes, this concept of hyper-uniformity. Because among the, the large number of correlations between the position of scatterers here in 2D that you can produce, there is this uh, special class of so-called hyper-uniform materials. So hyper-uniformity is a, is a broad concept okay, that is not useful only for wave scattering. And it was introduced by Torquato and, and Stiliger almost 20 years ago now. So if you want to learn about 
hyper uniformity in general. Uh, I can advertise, for example, this, uh, this very nice review by, by Torquato. But here I will only again uh, use one specific property of hyper uniformity to, to show you the huge effects you can get when you, um, when you uh, study the interaction of light with hyper uniform material. So hyper uniformity is defined as a, <clears throat> a property of the sort of factor that is such that the sort of factor actually goes to zero when Q tends to zero. If, if you use, uh, if you just use a, a, a random uh, uh, distribution of particles and you start to induce in a way to be defined that is not important in what I'm saying now, some a degree of partial order, what you get up, what you end up with usually is a structure factor that saturates to a finite value at Q equals zero. When you tend to Q equals zero, or even when you, when you vanish, in a neighborhood of the origin, then you get a structure that is not any kind of structure that is quite peculiar, that is called hyper-uniform. By the way, a periodic structure is hyper-uniform. But here I'm interested in structures that are hyper-uniform and disordered. Okay? If you want um, a real space picture of hyper-uniformity, you can think about doing this. You you cut a large sphere, or in 2D, just a disk. So you cut a large sphere in your distribution of points, and you count the number of points inside this sphere. You do that for many disordered configurations, and you compute an ensemble average. If the distribution is completely random, then what you get is that the variance of the number of points scales like the average value, which is a feature of a Poisson type distribution. In the case of hyper uniform media or hyper uniform distribution of point, what you get is that when you make this sphere larger and larger, you find that the variance increases slower than the average value of the number of points inside the sphere. Which means that if you zoom out, you zoom out, you zoom out, then you, you get something that is more and more uniform. And that explains this idea of hyper uniformity. Okay, so this is qualitatively the picture you can have in mind. You distribute the points the better you can, although it's disorder, so that fluctuations at large scale are reduced. Okay, and the variance is smaller than the, 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 the average value, which you don't have for any distribution. So now uh, let, let's start to see some uh, effects connected to uh, light interaction with this. So if you, so now I'm showing you some simulations. Okay? So what I have here is a slab with scatterers distributed randomly in the slab. You illuminate the slab with a beam and you compute the scattered intensity versus the observation angle. So I start with a completely disordered distribution of point, okay? So the mean three pass LB, you remember, is just the density of scatterers times the scattering cross-section of individual scatterers. My LB is my reference. So here I consider a situation where the thickness of the medium is a bit smaller than this mean three pass. So it's the so-called single scattering regime. And as you may remember for lectures, we probably had on X-ray scattering or neutron scattering in which in those situations, you're most of the time when you interact with small pieces of material in the single scattering regime, you probably learn that the scattered intensity in that case is directly proportional to the structure factor. Actually, that's the way you measure a structure factor on a crystal. Okay, you look at the distribution of intensity versus angle and you get this directly. Okay, so it's directly proportional. So now if you assume that you've created a hyper uniform distribution of point that is such that in a neighborhood of Q equals zero, the social factor is equal zero if you're a theoretician, is very small if you do practical stuff. Then if, <clears throat> so Ki is the incident K vector, okay? So the, the length of this arrow is two pi over lambda. So you see that if the wavelength is large enough so that this arrow is a small enough so that Q for any direction theta is inside this gray circle, then you will kill scattering for all directions. And this is obviously what you get when you do the calculation. If you, for a completely disordered system, 
you look at the intensity versus angle in that specific case, you get for the uncoated system, you get an intensity that it looks like a speckle pattern. Okay? You have a very uh, chaotic distribution versus the angle. And for the same particle, the same density. Now, if the points are distributed on a hyper uniform pattern, then you almost don't see anything because you just reduced scattering. And the, the, the small amount of scattering you have is just that because in practice, you don't have exactly S of Q equals zero. Okay? So this is obviously what you get. But now the nice thing is that under some conditions that we describe in that paper, and I'm not going to enter too much the details, but even in the multiple scattering regime for which you don't have this simple relation, scattered intensity is proportional to S of Q, but the, the story is a bit more complex. Then you can, so you start with a medium that is in the multiple scattering regime. So the, here, the disordered system has a mean free path that is five times smaller than the thickness, which means that the direct light is, ex, is attenuated by exponential minus five. Okay, so it's already a strongly scattering medium. So you see for the uncoated distribution of point, this red distribution with a lot of intensity back reflected. Okay, this is I versus theta here. You have a lot of reflection, and which is a feature of a strongly scattering system. But now, if you, with the same scatterers, the same density, have a distribution that is hyper uniform, then you can again reduce almost to zero, in principle to zero, in practice to the, let's say, the, the, the background noise value of the S of Q that you get. You reduce the intensity by a huge factor, and you make a kind of homogenization because light goes through the medium as if it was transparent, okay? But it's not a, a trivial homogenization. Let's say the usual, a usual homogenization regime where you would change the density. Okay, here the density is unchanged, but still you get at the end a medium that looks effectively transparent because of interferences between all the scatterers that are distributed on a hyper uniform pattern. So in summary, what, I, what I've shown you is that you can start from a situation like that, mean three pass much smaller than the thickness for the completely disordered system, a lot of scattering. With the same scatterer, same density, you can get something that is like an effective transparent medium, which means that the mean three pass, now that accounts for correlations, has become much larger than the thickness of the medium. So the interesting thing is that <clears throat> beyond this idea of uh, inducing transparency, on which I will come back uh, with practical examples um, in a few minutes, you can also think about um, playing with absorption. So um, the picture is actually quite simple. Assume you start with, a, you have a material that is again, so far it's a, it's the theoretician vision of a material, okay? It's a distribution of points, small scatterers, distributed in a otherwise transparent matrix, okay? But now assume that those scatterers are also absorbing. So you have absorption, you can have a little amount of absorption inside the scatterers, okay? Which means instead of being white, your material would be gray, okay? And then assume that you, you increase the absorption, you increase the absorption cross section of each of the scatterers. So this parameter here, actually, when you move from left to right, what you do is that you increase the absorption in the individual scatterers, and all of them are assumed to be the same. Okay. So now for the uncoated system, what you get, obviously, that if you compute the average absorbed power normalized by the incident power, then this absorbed power will increase but at some point we saturate, but it will saturate. Why? Because your medium is scattering. So scattering is a loss for absorption. Everything that is scattered out, of course, is not absorbed, okay? But what you can see is that with the same scatterers and the same absorption in each of those scatterers, then now if the points are distributed on a hyper uniform medium, since you kill scattering, what you get is that you get a effective homogeneous medium, then you kill scattering. And as soon as your medium becomes a bit more, a bit thicker 
than the absorption mean three pass, then it can be almost perfectly absorbing. So these are, these are numerical simulations that you see here. You have two curves. I'm not commenting why you have two curves. One is an exact calculation. The other one is a model. But what we have shown in, in, in that paper is that you reach here a limit that actually is, is an upper bound that you can derive theoretically. You have an upper bound for absorption in, in, the, in the case of a scattering material like that. And then with hyperuniformity, you can optimize absorption up to that upper bound. So we have also discussed the fact that it's not a small effect. Okay. So what, what, what I show here is the ratio between the absorbed power for a hyper-uniform medium divided by the absorbed power in the completely disordered medium. Okay. So this is the enhancement of absorption you get for different levels of absorption in the scatterers. You get a maximum for a thickness that, as I was telling you, that is a bit larger than the absorption means with us. And we can also even have an idea of the absorption enhancement that we can get. So you see, these are not small effects. So in principle, you can really get something <laughs> that would be very close to a black body, actually. So you have, again, the absorption is in the scatterer. If you put the absorption in, in the matrix, it's probably a different story. Okay, But you have a little bit of absorption in, in the scatterers, you can make the system very absorbing. And the nice thing with uh, the fact that it's diffuse light that you control is that you can have this enhancement of absorption. Okay, So the enhancement in that case is from the red to the black curve for a huge range of incidence angle. It's very robust against changes in incidence and also against changing in the wavelengths because it's not a, reason, a resonant effect. So with a diluted material, in principle, you could get something that really uh, uh, goes very close to a black body. So the picture you can keep in mind is that we start from something that is scattering, but that is a bit gray because you have a little bit of absorption. You get to something that is almost like a black body, okay? Because thanks to correlations, you make the scattering means to pass very large. There's no more scattering. And the nice thing, because you could ask this very important question, but I'll give the answer before you ask. And, and we derived that in that paper, if you want to have a look at the details. But the nice thing is that by tuning the position of the particle, actually, you can change drastically the scattering mean free pass, but you don't change that much the absorption mean free pass, which was a kind of, of a surprise to us. So now we understood that theoretically. But that has a, a very uh, important consequence in practice, okay? Because if you if you want to design uh, the sort of factor uh, in such a way that you get something that has that given level of absorption, if by changing S of Q you change a lot both the scattering and the absorption property, then it, it becomes very hard to control uh, the business, okay? But here the idea is that if you start with a medium whose absorption mean free pass is a bit smaller than the thickness. And this you can control with the density of scatterers. And then you, you tune correlation so that you make the, the, the material not scattering, but you don't change that much the absorption mean repair, then you get to this regime. So in practice, it's not a detail that absorption is almost unaffected by, by correlation or weakly affected by correlation compared to the, to the scattering mean repair. All right, so that, that was uh, for the, um, the, let's say, conceptual uh, <clears throat> part. And now I, I'd like to show you some first steps, okay, into some, uh, some way of building material that would behave like that. So it's also a very, it's been a very, very active topic now uh, in the last five to 10 years. And um, I, I just want to, to show two examples to show that you, you can have two different, two different approaches to, to this business, uh, of course, with different, uh, uh, with different uh, let's say, first principle objectives. Okay. Of course, you could think about designing a hyper-uniform structure in the computer and then to fabricate this material by top-down lithography. Franck Sheppold, Sheppold and his group have, have made a lot in that direction, and they succeeded in, uh, in fabricating 
structure like that uh, that not only uh, are hyper uniform but that scatter light a lot in the near infrared so they could show uh, the appearance of band gaps in a material that is not periodic which is another feature of hyper uniformity that i'm not discussing today they could also show evidence of the fact that those materials are good candidates to to really demonstrate Anderson localization of light in 3D. Okay, so that's very interesting uh, for for basic study. But of course, if you want to to build uh, real materials, you have to find other ways to produce hyper uniformity by self organization or self assembly. So that's one example of something that that has been tried in two dimensions by using. Uh, microfluidics to produce a two-dimensional material that is, made, that is made of two kinds of droplets. So you have like, at the end, you can have beads, you have large ones and small ones. And depending on the number of small compared to one, you have uh, two large ones. Okay? You have uh, control parameters. That is the number of, let's say, large particles divided by the number of small particles. You can get you can get a regime where you get some kind of polycrystalline phase, but you can also get a regime where you get this, uh, this uh, disordered phase that shows, these are social factors here, that shows a very large degree of hyper uniformity. So I'm not entering too much that, but you have uh, several groups. This has become an active, very active field uh, in, uh, in soft matter physical chemistry to try to find self assembly, self organization processes that would by themselves build hyper uniform structures. In practice, again, you don't really need to go to a purely hyper uniform structure, okay? You don't really care if this is really going to zero. Here, the important thing is that this is going more than one order of magnitude below what you would get for a, for a completely disordered system, okay? So you, you need to do something that, goes one or two orders of magnitude below what you would get for the other structure. And you start to see something very interesting in terms of interaction with waves. So it's, near, it's not pure hyper uniformity in, in a mathematical way, but it's very interesting. For example, in that direction of producing transparency or producing black body uh, like absorbers that, that do not scatter light. I was telling you that this topic uh, is an old topic, so maybe, maybe uh, some of you know uh, about that. Uh, but uh, you have a photonic liquid on your eye, actually the, the structure of the cornea. So here what you see is a, is a picture, <clears throat> electron microscope image, where you see uh, to the, cor the cornea is made of stacks of collagen fibrils, let's say in water, okay? it's a nitrogel. And uh, what you see here are cross section of the fibrils. Here you see those fibrils in, in another direction. So you can think of those fibrils as being um, cylinders with a diameter on the order of 13 nanometers and length of several microns. And you see they are, they are arranged on a network, on a pattern that is not a crystal, but that is uh, quite organized. So uh, at, at this density and, and, and given the scattering cross section of all those individual two dimensional scatterers, if the system was completely disordered, then you, your cornea would scatter light and would be white. So it, it, it took a long time for, <clears throat> to understand what was the origin of the transparency of the cornea. And I think that this paper 1969 uh, is really the, the first paper that, that gives the full picture. And what they've shown is that you have, uh, so here it's the pair correlation function that they plotted uh, based on, on, on the images. The Fourier transform of that is this S of Q. And then in the paper, actually, they really derive a formula like that, that explains that since you have a shorter factor that is due to the interaction between those cylinders, then you get a reduction of scattering that explain the transparency of the cornea over the visible range, uh, which is, uh, I think, it's, I think it's, 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 a, it's an amazingly good paper, actually, published in, a, in the Journal of the Optical Society of America. Probably today, the author would send that to Nature directly. But, so the paper is written in a very modest way. Uh, 
but it's an amazing paper that explains something that is very important. And, and, and the, the real uh, ingredient is correlations. Okay, so that's interesting to, to see this. Um, and, and by the way, it was also recognized by, uh, I think this was first recognized by, by uh, the late uh, Juan Ro Science. Actually, actually, the first guy who told me about this was Juan Ro, that it's exactly the same physics that you have uh, in liquid metals. So again, uh, I don't want to escape too much from the main topic, but it's, it's interesting that you realize that it, it's, al it's almost at the same time the transparency of the cornea was understood. That uh, so this is Ashcroft. This is the Ashcroft from Ashcroft and Mermin, if you know the book. Uh, there was a, 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 a something not really understood is that it was understood that band theory explained the conductivity, the good conductivity of metals in a crystal, but it was not understood why a liquid metal in which you lose the crystalline structure was still conducting so good electricity. I mean, people were expecting that the resistivity would be huge. And actually the measurement showed a resistivity that was not so huge. So the conductivity was much better than expected. And this paper explains that the ions, even in a liquid, have repulsive interaction. So it's a strongly correlated liquid. Okay, and then you get a structure factor. And since the resistivity is explained by scattering of electron waves in this disordered arrangement of ions, given a structure factor, if you calculate the conductivity correctly, then you understand the measurements. So the conductivity is better, which means the mean free pass is larger actually than what you would expect, assuming that the system would be completely disordered. It's exactly the same formula and the same physics as the transparency of the cornea. So that's, I think it's interesting to, to look at that uh, from a purely um, wave physics point of view. Okay. So now this is, I'm, I'm coming to the, to the end. So I, I want to show you some, um, some amazing uh, materials that our colleagues, Nadine Nassif and our group have produced. So these are uh, collagen hypogels that really look like a cornea actually. So what you get, so this is amazing because uh, if you think about materials like that, it's, it's more than 95% of water. Okay? So they found uh, a way, they found a process to produce uh, a material like this by starting from collagen molecules. Okay? Collagen is what you get in, in your muscles. Okay? So it, it's, it's an important uh, constituent of, of biological tissues. And uh, you start um, with collagen molecules in, in, uh, in water and then with a process that I would be unable to, to describe, but uh, it took them, uh, I, I think two years to get an in vitro process that would by self-assembly, self-organization, you have those molecules that assembles to do collagen fibrils just like in the cornea. And then they assemble in a network to produce an hydrogel. So it's a material. So this piece here is on the order of one centimeter. Okay? And it's scattering because it's a disordered arrangement of a collagen fibrils. But they discovered that uh, you, they could make materials with an, an increasing, in that direction you increase the concentration the initial concentration in collagen molecules. And they discovered that at the magical concentration, they get transparency. So they were puzzled by the fact that they could have a material that is highly scattering. You make it denser, it becomes transparent, but then you make it denser and it becomes highly scattering again. So it, it cannot be a trivial, uh, explanation by a change in concentration with what I would call a usual homogenization process. So this has to do with correlations. So they were really uh, puzzled by that. So the, the first step that we, uh, the first work that we did with them uh, was to, uh, to explain them that you could have a parameter to characterize the degree of transparency. Okay, so this parameter is just the scattering mean three pass. And by the way, uh, by using, I'm, I'm not detailing this here, but I just want to let you know that this parameter, you can measure it in, in situ, inside materials. And it's by taking advantage of a drawback of optical coherence tomography, which is a, 
a technique that allows you to do reflection tomography in scattering material. A huge drawback is that when you go deeper inside the sample, the signal is attenuated exponentially by scattering. But you can actually, instead of just playing with the image, you integrate along this image or you average along this image the decay curve and you get a very nice exponential from which you can deduce the value of the scattering mean three pass inside the material. Okay, so you it's, it's, it's important to know that you can measure this parameter even inside the material. So we did that actually. So this, this is uh, what you get. So this is again the same piece of material. So by, by measuring the, the scattering mean three pass at different locations, we could explain by a parameter, okay, this uh, qualitative observation of occurrence of, of transparency and be able to quantify this change in, uh, in the scattering mean three pass. I'm not telling too much. If you want details, you can look at the paper, but we found values and a behavior that is very similar to what you find in real corneas. So by looking at the microstructure, so there, there's no way at this stage that we could really measure and characterize a structure factor for that, that we would just plug into a simple formula to get the mean three pass. Okay? But the only thing I can tell you so far is that what we observed is that at this specific concentration, and I will end up with this, at this specific concentration, you, we found that first you have this increase of the scattering mean three pass. At the same time, you have amazing mechanical properties that we measured. You could, you could look at the paper, but you've seen the movie at the beginning where you really get something that looks like a material that you can stretch but below or above this critical concentration, you lose those mechanical properties. So it's a bit amazing, but at the same, in the same condition, this hydrogel, which again is very similar to what you get in the real cornea, exhibits transparency and biomimetic, actually, mechanical properties. And the third observation is that at this concentration, if you look at TEM pictures that you can see here, then we found that the, let's say the nanostructure shows this, an arrangement of collagen fibrils that really looks like what you get in the real cornea. And it's not what you observe below or above this critical concentration. So that, that's where um, we are so far uh, with Nadine and, 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 and co-workers. So it's, I think interesting from the point of view of production of photonic materials, because you can do uh, amazing stuff that can self-assemble over large scales okay, by, by using, let's say quite simple, um, maybe not simple to, to find, but then when, once you found them, the, 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 all the parameters you need, then you get, uh, you, you, can, you can fabricate a lot of quite easily those materials. They show amazing properties at the same time, mechanical and optical. And it could be also an explanation of what the, 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 the in vivo self-organization process really is. Because I think it's still uh, not clear how in vivo those kind of structures are, are produced. Okay? Because it's a bit amazing if you, if you remember this picture uh, of the real corner, you really have a mono dispersed. Uh, quite organized network of collagen fibrils, which is uh, not something you get by chance. Okay? So you probably need a, a kind of robust and uh, easy, again, probably the chemist would, would not like my easy, but I mean, with uh, uh, well-controlled uh, interaction processes that, that help producing those amazing structures. So that, uh, that brings me to the end. And I uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Remy, for the nice presentation. We have uh, now time for questions. So either you you can just unmute yourself and ask the, the question. I think the, uh, I was I'm looking at the chat at the same time, but please just unmute yourself and ask freely the the question. 